Hello, I am Coral. Welcome to part two of my Inscription Casey Mod Guide. In the first part, we went through a run in Medius Res. And I showed you the basis of exactly what gameplay that is capable of winning the higher tiers of your runs, and consistently the entirety of the mode, will look like. Now, let's talk cards and starter decks and challenges. In the game, you will have all of these locked. The ones that I still have locked, those are ones that are in the higher levels of the challenge. You will start out by being able to get access to the Cuckoo, the Direwolf, the Direwolf Pup, which turns into a Direwolf, Flying Ants, which can be combined with normal ants, the Lamgineer, the Mealworm, Mud Turtle, the Raccoon, the Wild Bull, the Wolverine, and the Mole Man disguised, which is the Ejerot. Of the first unlocks that you will actually get that will make your runs more consistent, it will be the Cuckoo and Ejerot. Wild Bull is also given at the same time as well as the Cuckoo, but it is those three cards that are probably the best out of the ones that are introduced that will be consistent for your runs. That's not to say every single card is bad, such as Dire Wolf being free 4 damage on a single tile, which is kind of like an upgraded wolf, but the caveat that it is going to require the ability to stay alive long enough to get that damage off. It's very rare you're going to have the opportunity to get a 3 card drop for a wolf, but getting a 2 card drop for a Dire Wolf pup to transform into a wolf is just as good. Adding on the fact that it's going to give you an additional bone, it can help alleviate some of the pressures of generating the cost necessary to get up some of the more expensive bone enemies, such as the Mealworm, the Raccoon, and the Wolverine. Wolverine probably being one of the better effects amongst the Alpha that will have a synergistic effect to keep your cards growing in strength. And Ejerot's Ejerot. As for the starter decks, each one is named for the specific thing that it is meant for. First is your starting deck, labeled Vanilla. That starts with the combination of a stoat, a bullfrog, and a wolf. This is probably the most consistent starting base for people who have yet to truly understand and learn how Casey's mod will play as they begin to grow in their skill level. It doesn't have an inconsistent basis, a wolf is always good, a stoat is always good, and a bullfrog is always good. Moving on from here, we move to the Bone Deck. This is consistent of a Rat King, an Alpha, and a Warren. This is probably the build that I would go with very often if I wouldn't run the Sacrifice deck or attempt to do the Ramping deck. The reason why this deck is good is this is the very same deck that I used in the last video to be able to put together to create that deck possible to win on the 7th run. The reason why is because it starts with one of the pieces necessary for a battery, which is a Warren. Hello. Along with this, the generation of your rat will allow you to make use of the attacking damage to potentially then get out your alpha. And then with the alpha and a couple of squirrels, it will be more than enough to be able to make it through your beginning battles as you start putting in more one-cost bloods and two cost to four cost bones in your deck. It will always be useful because of the fact of how quickly you can start generating bones. And once you're able to transform and turn a card into a battery, however you choose to do that, preferably using your Warren, you will be able to get further along in your run than you would with the vanilla deck, because the vanilla deck itself does not have a battery system. You would have to, at least at the very minimum, Look for a blocking card that you can transform into a battery, rather than already having a blocking card that can then operate as a battery once you have the sigils necessary. Moving on from this, we have the Ant deck, consisting of the first, which is only unlocked after you actually win with this deck, first cards that are new, namely the Flying Ant itself, and the deck consisting of an Ant Queen, the Flying Ant, and a Skunk. This deck is a ramping deck, but not the same as this deck. 
And the reason why these two decks are similar is because the Ant deck is a deck that punishes you for losing your Ants. Ants are power. So, once you have the Queen on the field, that's one power. Then, the additional Worker Ant that is generated by her is two. The Flying Ant equals three, which means with all three of these up, and the fourth slot assumptively being generated and locked by the Skunk, means that you have nine incoming damage attacking the enemy board in all three, in three positions. This can be useful depending on what the Flying Ant is attacking over. If there's a stump in front of you, you won't be blocked off from doing damage. Otherwise, you're going to have to find a way to get Pyfurricated Strike onto your Ant Queen or find a, a character that will be able to utilize Bifurricated or Trifurricated Strike in order to get around obstacles. Flying over enemies and dealing with general damage and fighting the Angler is actually one of the beneficial strengths of this build because of the fact that you can fly directly over the shark bait. However, compared to the other ramping deck, which we're going to call the Campfire deck, this consists of a rare drop Mantis God and two Ringworms. The idea behind this deck is not so dissimilar from that of the Warren inside of the Bone, but is not as strong as the Ant or the Vanilla or even Sacrifice. Because of the fact that this deck is going to encourage you to try to use campfires to kill off one or both of the ringworms, so that you can be able to start using the full upgrade effect of the campfires. Because the map is randomly generated, it's not going to be guaranteed that you're going to get a campfire when you start with this deck. And, because it's not guaranteed that you're going to instantaneously fail the second try on your campfire, there's going to be some runs where you're going to try to kill both of these rings, and both of them survive. If that happens, you basically have to take whatever benefit it just gave you and try to turn that ringworm into a usable card. Even though they start out as 0-1s, and they're effectively blocking tokens that you have to pay for, once they actually have damage, or they have health, you can start looking for additional sigils to burn onto the card to make the ringworm useful. For example... Even though the ringworm itself does not belong to a group, I don't think. I don't think it belongs to the insectoid family. Once the ringworm is something like a 3-6 attacker, putting unkillable on top of it means you will never lose that card. And this is also the same problem when it comes to your mantis god. The idea of the deck is to buff the mantis god so that the mantis god can do what it does best. But if you don't have unkillable or fecundity on this card, you're going to suffer for it because it means that you have to play your damage in order to push certain fights. And versus the Trapper and Trader, this is very, very lethal. Versus the Trapper and Trader, it's lethal. Versus the Prospector, it's lethal. And depending on how you chose to cycle your cards, when you're fighting the Angler, it can be lethal. If you ever play the card beforehand, before you end up generating the bait sharks that you need on the board, you can accidentally end up triggering the sharks to attack you and end your run. And then, there's no, and then there's no guarantee that you're even going to make it to Leshy using this. That's actually a terrifying fact about all four of these starting decks. The inconsistency of the deck is not based in the energy cost, and it's not based in the sacrifice costs to upkeep your hands per turn. It's the turn one consistency of pulling the card necessary to win, and the efficiency of how your deck will work when you face Leshy. If the deck cannot beat Leshy... You need to make the deck beat Leshy. To make the deck beat Leshy, you need win conditions. To put the win condition into your deck means not just to play to the effect of what your deck allows you to work with, but to fill in what you don't have. The vanilla deck covers the need of having a strong attacker, a good defender, and a good one-cost card on two cards that can be in your first hand. The power of the starting deck is the ability to immediately, if you pull it, to get out a 2-1 attacker that will be able to generate the bones that if it dies, it can now sustain itself for a new attacker that will then replace the damage that you just lost by making creatures on the outside of the alpha attack for you. This means consistent damage, this means ramping damage, and not being punished for enemies dying and minions dying. The ramping deck better benefits being able to get attacks out on the board and can better allow you to block off damage 
with whatever you choose to pick up for your first starting card to delay for as long as possible until the combo can be assured and then filling in additional damage to wail over until you get to the point that you can get the ants on field. And the ramping deck requires, if not necessitates, the need of picking up cards that will be better picked so that you can be able to spend more time upgrading and less time scrambling to find cards that will help you get Mantis God on field. Finally, for the ones that I have locked here, which we will be recovering once these are unlocked for me, we have the Sacrifice deck, which is probably the most consistent turn one deck that you can start with that can be somewhat useful, depending on whether or not you put enough one cost in your deck to sustain until you're able to get out whatever card you choose to affix with Black Goat. It comes with a blocker, it comes with Sacrifice, and it comes with a Moose Buck. There's really nothing much that can be said about this. This has everything you need except for a battery. Between all five of these that I have access to right now, I think the most consistent that I would choose every time would be Bone and Sacrifice. And then ramping for Campfire if you feel like you can get lucky. From there, you have the challenges. These last three have not been unlocked yet by me. But I can tell you from what I have chosen, what I prefer to have and use, with the check marks representing every challenge that I've done and have succeeded with. No hook is extremely bad, and the reason why is your item starts are the thing that allow you to survive. Items basically fill in what you lack. If you don't have the ability to reposition cards on the board, a stopwatch will allow you to move them. If you don't have the squirrels or the black goats necessary to put that big two cost and three cost blood on the field, that black goat and that squirrel that you have bottled might be enough. Do you need to survive for damage? The boulder and or the frozen possum will be good enough. And most especially, is there a card on the field that you can't cut but you need to pull over otherwise you would lose the fight? This is where the fishing hook comes in handy. Without that fishing hook, you would get a different item, yes, but sometimes fishing hook is the only thing that will bail you out of a bad situation. So I value my fishing hook over everything else. Smaller backpack doesn't really do anything other than remove an additional space. Rather than having three items, you have two items. But with this, this actually is a boon, because this means with fewer items to gain, you're more likely to be able to sustain what you have with a pack rat. Either using the pack rat's effect, or sigiling a pack rat. You can be able to upkeep your backpack, and never really have to concern yourself with taking any more items in fights at all. An early pack rat in the beginning of your run can usually be enough to keep yourself in the game. Because going to Leshy and needing to spend an item shop to get up to then collect what you need is not optimal. And in this game, as much as I dislike it, being optimal is the most important thing. Pricey Pelts and No Clover. These are not as detrimental as you might think. It's nice to reroll, but removing it is going to teach you to learn to think about what you can make a card do and how you can make it beneficial to what your deck needs. Whereas Pricey Pelts is going to entice you to learn how to do more damage. Realistically, you don't need to be pulling anything other than a rare. And it's mainly because it's related to no boss rares. But Pricey Pelts is just there. If there's ever a five point that you need to fill on your challenge points, you would pick this up just because of the fact that it's not going to make much of a difference. You're going to be avoiding most pelt shops anyways, unless you're having to take a trapper on a lane where you cannot risk taking a totem fight. Which then brings me to boss totems, tip scales, no boss rares, and all totem battles. The way that this interacts with more difficult is it makes every encounter that you face that much more scarier. Single candle, realistically, is just making it more like a proper roguelite. You don't get to upgrade your candelabra 
with an additional candle. So, with two candles, you go into a boss fight and you get to have a smoke, which operates as a bone cost replenishing squirrel. With single candle, it makes these more scarier, but these are already scary enough to begin with. Making every single battle a totem battle means that every single battle needs to end within the first three turns, because the longer they go on, the faster, more difficult is going to ramp up. With boss battles having totems, this is not as scary, but it can be problematic. Having enemies that have certain totem effects can make it very scary. Fortunately, one of the patch changes they made within the last five patches is that you will no longer see the most powerful totems getting used in boss battles. But the totems are still there. They are still something you need to respect. Tipped scales means that you need to be very careful about how you choose to start. If you end up with a dead hand of cards that you cannot play on the field until you pull a squirrel and you must pass the turn, if you don't have a stopwatch to be able to skip, you are risking losing outright. Anything with bifurcated strike, anything with trifurcated strike, anything that has over two damage with those, anything that has been totemed to have bifurcated strike, like a rattler, anything with two damage or more that you cannot be able to deal with in three turns or less is going to end your run. Dead stop. There's no, there's no way around it. So you have to draft to make that first hand as strong as possible to avoid that causality. Because if you have a strong card that can at least hit hard enough to offset the extra damage that you already have on the scale, you're not going to survive your run. Especially if you just happen to die in the middle of a really great run, and the only thing that's killed you was the fact that you were off by one damage. It is because of tip scales that the pliers, even though you don't have access to the knife, is as good as every other item inside of Casey's mod. Because equalizing the scale, and also freeing up an item slot so that you can make beneficial use of a smaller backpack, can be a win and lose scenario. Plus, if you choose to go with a smaller backpack, your backpack will go from the fish hook, a squirrel, and the pliers to just the fish hook and the squirrel. With totems being on the field, and with bosses being harder, this is where Noth boss rares can be a hit or miss. Usually, having the ability to pull a rare is the question of will you be lucky enough to get an Ejirat? Will you be lucky enough to get a Gek? Will you be lucky enough to pull an Ouroboros? Will you be lucky enough to pull a 3 cost or a 4 cost Yura Yuli? That is usually what having a rare means. That or an amalgam. When you have no boss rares on, it just means that every boss is now a free shop. You can't pass on cards, but sometimes there are some rares that are not as good as other normal cards. And having better chances at better sigils really just makes it look like it's a roll on a slot machine. So if you're able to pull something out of a boss rare box that is now showing normal cards that can end up being something you can sigil onto another card by sacking it at an altar, it can be the major difference between finding the card you need to fuel a battery and not fueling that battery. And of course, single candle. It is probably the most consistent thing to get used to. You're not going to have the fallback of having the smoke to get extra cards on field, and this is probably the thing that is the most important behind why the philosophy of generating a battery card is so important. Without having that smoke, fighting on the bosses is going to be harder than normal. Just by the nature of not having that extra card. Now that we go through that, I can be able to show you what some runs would start as if you start with these kinds of run mechanics. So on this run, I have no boss rares, boss totems, all totems, and single candle. On your first pick, the way that you are going to look at these cards here depends on what you already have accessible to you. Because we're using a sacrifice deck, we already have a black goat, and we already have them all. 
Because of this, we have a defender, and we have the sacrifice mechanic to get out our moose buck. So, most important thing for us to do here is to actually fill the board with something that is useful that will be beneficial for our purposes. For our purposes, what we need is one costs. Ound, and we also need some general bloods that we can then turn into bones. On this board, there are only really four choices that you can take. Quartz maggots can potentially be free because anything that dies will summon the corpse maggot. Skink is probably one of the best cards and also the best battery. Ringworm means the potential to be able to get campfires early. And here, card counter potentially means that while you're holding cards in hand, waiting to get out your moose buck, your cards will get stronger over time. On this run, I'm going to take the skink and the ringworm. Now we have our choice between a shop and a totem. A totem potentially makes our cards stronger by giving us an effect that we can actually look for. Meanwhile, a pack rat just means we have an additional attacker that we can consistently rely on when we aren't able to pull our moose buck in hand. Just a second, I need to go to the kitchen. I can smell my food. Don't want to make sure it burns. Okay. Fortunately, nothing's burned. So, for the consistency of the run, this is where your first choices are going to start mattering. You will always encounter the trapper at the start of the run, and if you happen to forfeit the run, he will give you one less uh, pelt to trade and will replace one of your pelts with a guaranteed opossum. For our purposes, since we have access to three items, we will always want to start off big and strong. And the strongest thing that you can do, if you don't know what totem that you'd like to look for, is to just take a pack rat. A 2-2 attacker is always useful. Now, from here, we actually have a very good starting hand. In all likelihood, when it pulls out the four cards that we need, there is a very good likelihood that it's going to end up pulling cards that we can play. If it pulls Moose Buck, there's a good chance it can also pull Black Goat. And if it does not pull Black Goat or Moose Buck, there's a good chance that it can end up pulling Pack Rack, Skink, or Mole. That way, rather than having to wait an extra turn to pull a card for Moose Buck, we will be able to immediately play Skink and immediately play Mole. Because of the both of these two operating as a dedicated defender and as a pseudo defender through the power of Loose Tail, that will be more than enough to use as an ability to keep yourself going. It is then, as we look at this fight, that we have to look behind the fight for the next three encounters. We have a random card selection and a blood card selection, followed by an altar on the left and a totem on the right. If we wanted to incentivize focusing on totems at the start, we would have gone this way, but I'm looking to try and incentivize making sure that I can do something with the ringworm 
the black goat, or the mole if possible. I'm looking here at this for that. And the thing that I'm looking for is that because we now have this pack rat, I'm looking to get the trinket bearer effect onto one of these cards as soon as possible. Because pulling out a card and summoning something for one blood that will then give me an item is extremely powerful. So, first pull, we end up pulling our squirrel, our moose buck, our skink, and our black goat. If we did not want to, we literally could just play the skink and then wait to pull another squirrel and then play the moose buck. Which is what I'm going to do. This kind of play is useful because we can never tell exactly where this enemy might go. Now we pull out a squirrel. We play the black goat. And we play the moose buck. Now, this damage is going to bleed here to the porcupine. I might take damage on the moose buck, but it doesn't matter. Porcupine will drop down and attack. And now, it's a scoop. Easy money. Now, we look past this again, and we look at the board. We have the choices, and now we have a Ken card choice and another randomized card choice. And if you see this line here, this line means that there is going to be an additional two choices ahead of this, one on the left and one on the right. But if we choose to skip this Ken choice, there will still be an additional choice behind it that will allow us to pick something. So we go back to the same question. Do we go to the left and potentially take a blood cost card? or a bone cost card, or randomly be given one of the cards that we could possibly use and then get the benefit of a totem, or instead take the benefit of the altar. I've decided I'm going to take the altar. We get offered a one blood, a three blood, and a bones. I could reroll this, but I'm looking for one bloods to begin with anyways. We end up getting a river otter. And now I can put the effect of the bearer onto one of my one costs and I choose to put it onto my River Otter. By sacrificing the card here, we make the deck smaller so that we can make it consistent. So now, I have the potential to pull one, two, three, four, five one-cost cards, meaning I will never have a dead hand because I will always have something to play. Now looking here, you can now see what I was talking about. This path opens up into another backpack, which then goes into another totem fight. Whereas this opens him to a question, and now into a totem, and then into another fight. If I felt like I needed to go here, I can always deviate to the left, but because we already have a pack rat, we can avoid taking items here if we don't want to. It's not bad to take the pack rats if we do, it's just that in the first map, there's not a very high likelihood of seeing a Mycenologist. So you're going to end up having to carry around those two cost cards until you can combine them into something else. Now, here's where I ask myself which way I want to go, and the way that I'd like to go here is to the right. Start up with a scattered field versus a wild bull, and we ended up pulling ringworm and mole. I'm going to play the mole on the field to block. This will buy us two turns to pull. play out and pull out the squirrel and the pliers to potentially give myself a buffer for the damage I'm going to take, potentially. And I'm going to play the skink 
to absorb a damage from the Wild Bull. Now, with Black Goat on the field, I'm able to play the Moose Buck and deal with the Wild Bull. And now, much as Leshy just, like, just told us, it's a scoop. And for people who do not know, scoop just means I scoop up my cards and I leave the table because the match is already over and I'm not going to waste my time to see it play out. But because we are good players, we're going to play out the duel as far as we can because if you take this, you don't get gold teeth. And I want my gold teeth. I gotta make a grill, baby! So now, we look at the board, and we can see what's happening here again. The right path deviates into the left for an item, and then back again for the totem, and then back again for a trapper and another card selection. This means that taking the right path is actually superior, because not only do we get a choice at a card, we also get a choice at a totem, and then potentially we can get a choice at another card, or potentially taking the trapper to start looking for an additional card. Think of the Trapper as a future guarantee at the next trader to be able to turn in a pelt to get an additional card from rather three choices or six choices. And in the case of rares, pulling up a rare like it's a boss uh, pull. We get offered a Cuckoo and a Wolf Cub and an Elk. I do not want to re-roll this because the Cuckoo is extremely strong for reasons already described. The Wolf Cub is just as strong because it transforms into a wolf. But because Cuckoo allows me to block out the board and stop prevent it and potentially stop future damage from even dropping down into position, I would take the Cuckoo instead. Now we come to our first totem. And to reference here, we look at our deck, and we look at what we potentially have in terms of our families. Right now, I have an avian family. Well, the ringworm is, is insectoid. We have an insectoid family. We have two antler families, and we have a reptilian family. It's showing us a reptilian and an antler, but it's also showing us a thorn. In situations like this, I would prioritize taking the base over the head. Now, the next totem. Same situation again. Play the boulder to block out damage potentially. We get the cards in hand. We sacrifice with the river goat to put out the moose buck. And then we drop the squirrel to be able to drop the skink. Wild bull get eliminated. And now it's scoop. Now, we see the choices ahead of ourselves. We see another guaranteed totem, we have the trapper, we have a campfire, and we have a random choice. With cards like these, I feel safe enough that I could potentially take a trapper card, because the pelts are not only to screw, are not only going to screw with your drawing power, 
but will be insurance, depending on what fight you actually face here, as a potential pseudo-blocker until you're able to replace it with a real card. And if I'm not feeling confident, I can always be able to back out and just take the card selection. I don't have a lot of teeth. So, since I don't have a lot of teeth, I'm simply just going to take the one pelt and leave. And, because I know what this boss is now, this is the Trapper Trader. So, this one pelt that I have is going to be an additional pelt on top of the potential, I think it's four. Three traps, yes. No, five. One for winning. Two, three, four. Yeah, five. The additional five pelts that I can potentially have to make the second turn of the battle better in my favor even though you don't get to keep any of those cards. Now, we can have the ability to think about the cards we pull again here. Remember that we have a bird head. We have one reptilian, two antlers, and one insectoid. If I were to take this, it would turn my insectoid into a thorn. And if I were to take it in the other way, it would turn my skink into a thorn. Realistically, I would prefer having my skink turn into a thorn. Since I want him to get hit anyways, I want to give him something that's going to make him powerful for doing so. I take the campfire here over the items because I don't need items. And now I get an upgrade for the health of one of my characters. Looking at this... The thing that I'd want to have more health is something that's going to be facing a lot of times in battle. And because we have two pseudo-blockers, but this one is the one that's going to be transformed into a battery, I would like to put it onto the skink. And the reason why I choose to put it onto the skink immediately, rather than trying to use the ringworm to force the fire, is it is not only right before a boss, but the health of the skink's tail effect for loose tail is based on the base health, based on the base, is based on the total max health of the skink being attacked. So a 0-2 skink would produce, or excuse me, a 1-2 skink by default would produce a 0-2 tail. A 1-24 skink would produce a 0-24 tail. Make sense? Makes sense. He ends up putting push on his reptiles, which means they're going to end up trading places a lot. I get a kind of okay hand. To start, we're going to play our mole to block and buy ourselves a turn. Going to wipe their sigils to make myself safer. I'm going to drop the river otter here to spring this leaping trap, and I got another paintbrush. Unfortunately, I'm going to have to pull one of them. I'm going to pull this strange frog and equalize the damage that's coming in. So, this will turn from three incoming damage to two incoming damage. This one will offset the two that I take, it will push my scale down one tick, and then I will regain two ticks every turn until something else drops into its place. Start pulling. We're able to pull Black Goat. I'm going 
gonna start the boost buck here because it's going to hit this wall and then reverb bounce backwards and then start moving from there. Otherwise, there's a chance that it would die on the strange frog. Old cuckoo. out. This is extremely terrifying. There's a good chance Mook's buck dies here, which will be a misplay on my part. And it does. ourselves a hard choice. Mm. On the field in front of us are eight potential choices and I can only take two. The way in which to choose the cards for this phase is what do you expect to be the most beneficial thing that you can use versus what you're facing. I have a strange frog which will be able to kill However, I do not want them to be in a detrimental situation where I cannot survive with them. So, in this situation, I'm going to pull off this skink and this card counter. I'm going to wipe the board. And then I'm going to play the card counter. Thorn loop, like, thorn loop is going to kill that off. Use this to play the skink. And then we win the duel. And now we have our cart selection. It offers us a grizzly, a turkey vulture, and a wild bull. Right now, we do not have good bone generation, so bones are right out. But then the question becomes, do you take the wild bull, or do you take the grizzly? And the answer here is what best fits into this deck. Yes, you have a black goat, but you only have one black goat. And it's not revivable. So... If you choose to put an additional blood cost into your deck that is three or more, you have to think about how you're going to feel it. It is easier for me to be able to, tool, to pull two squirrels or put a card down along with another card on the field and sack them to get out a wild bull than it is for me to do the same thing for a grizzly. Until we have that token generation, it's just not safe to pull the grizzly here. And like that, that is the general idea of exactly what you have to do to be able to consistently become good enough to make a deck work into map 1, past map 1, and into map 2. And here, the choices become whatever it is you need to fill out the rest of the deck. 
Because now that you have your basis, namely a battery, a means of recovering items over time, something to block the field, and attackers to be able to win with the duel, now the question becomes, how are you going to pull those cards as much as you possibly can? This is what map two and map three are all about. First, you get the cards you need for the combo. Then, you start working on keeping those cards for the combo. Fortunately, there is... I'm going to end it there, only because I need to edit this, but that should be enough of a basis to go from there. I will see you in part three, as we start working on how to be able to go from there. Remember... I am your host, Coral, and I will see you again. Same bad time, same Coral channel.